I'm going to calculate the Fourier coefficients for the function shown here. Sin t for part of its domain and then 0 for the next part and then with period 2 pi. Stare at it for a moment and then I'll scroll up the sketch. Here's what it looks like. Because the definition of this function contains a sign, you'd be forgiven for believing that only the b ends survive. But actually look at the shape of the function. It is neither odd nor even. A function which is neither odd nor even should expect to have both sines and cosines in its Fourier series. That's, it may seem a bit unusual the first time you meet it, but it's perfectly reasonable. This function will have both a's and b's for its Fourier coefficients. Since the period is 2 pi, we can quickly calculate the omega, the angular frequency. It turns out to be just 1. So let's write down our Fourier series for our f of t with the a's and b's in. There it is, that's just standard. Now we need to calculate the a's and b's. Let's start with a0. Here's the generic form. Then when we substitute the value for f of t, remember f was sine t only as far as pi, and then it drops to 0. I won't scroll that back because you can still see the graph here. That means that we only need to integrate from 0 to pi. It's this integral here, which we can immediately do. The final answer is a result of cos pi being negative 1 and cos 0 being 1. Then we get minus 2 in the bracket and there's a minus outside, so that makes 2 over pi. Let's move on now and look at the a n's for n not equal to 0. Here's the integral we get. Now I've discussed in great detail integrals with this kind of form in another maths cast. It's a maths cast with this name here. In that maths cast I explain how it is important to distinguish between the cases here in this integral for example where n may be 1 or might be something other than 1. We have to deal with those cases separately. Let's look at the case where n is not equal to 1 first. What happens is that we have to use combinations of the sum and difference formulae for the trig functions. The result for this particular product, sine t times cos nt, is the following. Once we've written the integral this way, we can do the integration. The negative sign has come out the front because the antiderivative of sine is negative cos. Now we need to put in the limits. Before I do that, can you see now why we must not allow n to be 1? Or negative 1 come to that? It's because of those denominators. If n is 1 or negative 1, then the fractions 1 over 1 plus n or 1 over 1 minus n blow up. The integration is then no longer well defined. For n equals 1, we have to go back and do the integral separately. Let's put in the limits now. I've collected the terms with 1 plus n and those with 1 minus n together. But now remember that cos of 0 is 1 and cos of a whole number times pi is negative 1 to the power of that whole number. Looks a little bit messy, doesn't it? But we can simplify it. Let's take that minus 1 to the power of 1 plus n or 1 minus n and separate off one of the powers using the power laws. Now we've got in both of the brackets inside here overall negative ones that can be pulled to the front to make the overall sign positive. At the same time, minus 1 to the negative n is the same as minus 1 to the n because after all a negative power is just the reciprocal of the same thing with the positive power. So let's use all that to start simplifying things. And now we can see that we can factorise because the stuff with the powers of negative 1 in is the same. I've just quickly corrected a sign there that I left out. Those should be pluses, not minuses. Anyhow, this simplifies further. Let's do it. Here's the first step. And now let's collect the terms containing n in the second bracket there. We get 2 over 1 minus n squared and the 2 has cancelled with the half that's outside everything. So here's our final expression. Remember, this is a n. Let's make some observations. 
When n is 0, what do we get? Well, negative 1 to the 0 is 1, so we get a 2 on top and a 1 on the bottom. That makes 2 over pi. That actually is the same a0 that we calculated before. In this particular case, we didn't really need to do it separately. There it is, you see, 2 over pi. But we couldn't really have known that in advance, so we did need to do a0. Let's go back quickly and look at the cases when n is not 0. Because of that power of negative 1 to the n, what happens is going to depend on the parity of n. Parity is just a fancy word for saying whether n is even or odd. When n is odd, we will get negative 1 to an odd power here. So we'll get minus 1 plus 1. So a n with odd n's are all 0. But then when n is even, minus 1 to an even power is plus 1. So now we get a 2 on top. So we get a n equals 2 over pi times 1 minus n squared. That's all the A's covered. Let's move on to the B's. Oh, hold on. Have you worked out what I've missed? We can't do the B's yet. We haven't done A1. All the work we just did was for the case n not equal to 1. We must not forget that. We've got to do A1 separately. Let's go back to the expression for the A's. Here it is, an. In this integral, we can put n equals 1. Sine of 1 minus nt will then disappear because we'll have sine of 0t there. On the other hand, the other part of the integral will have sine of 2t in. So we'll get a1 is 1 over pi, integral 0 to pi, a half sine 2t. I've carried through the integration here because it wasn't too hard. We get cos of 2 pi minus cos of 0 once we put in the limits. That comes to 0. That's nice because, after all, we earlier suggested that for odd n's, the a's should be 0. So it turns out that a1 is consistent with that. The thing is that we do have to do it separately to check it. It might have been different. So now we're ready to move on to the b's. Here's the formula. Once again, we have to look at the situation with n either not equal to 1 or equal to 1. Let's do n not equal to 1 first. Here's the integral after use of the sum and difference formulae. Cos just integrates to sine, so we can do those integrals. This time, putting in the limits causes everything to disappear. Sine of 0, of course, is 0, but so is sine of any whole numbers of pi. So this whole thing goes to 0. It remains to check b1. Do you think it'll be 0 as well? Well, let's do it. It's waiting for us there at the top. All we've got to do is put n equals 1. So we'll get the integral of sine squared t. Ah, if you know your integrals, you should be guessing now it's not going to be 0. This time, the sum and difference formulae for sine squared tell us that sine squared is a function involving a constant and cos of 2t. In fact, the integrand becomes a half times 1 plus cos 2t. So we do the integration, and then substituting the limits will kill off the sine 2t term, because sine of 2 pi and sine of 0 are, are both 0. However, the t separately does give something non-zero. In fact, when we put the top limit in, we just get pi, which cancels and gives us a value 1 half. So b1 is a half. Let's summarise everything that we've found now. There's everything. Stare at it just for a moment, and then I'll write down the actual Fourier series. To write down the Fourier series, let's start with the b's. There's only going to be one that uh, survives. That's the one with b1. So the Fourier series will start with a half sine t. Then there'll be the constant term that comes from a0. a0, remember, was 2 over pi, but we have to take a half a0, so that's going to be 1 over pi. And then there'll be the infinite sum of the a terms, the ones with cos in. Each a n has 2 over pi at the front, and then we need to insist that we only get even n's. The device for doing that 
is to replace n with 2n instead. So where it was 1 minus n squared before, we'll get 1 minus 4n squared, because 2 squared is 4, of course. And we must use that device in the cos as well. So instead of cos nt, we'll now get cos of 2nt. We can see explicitly that we only get the even terms by writing out the first few terms of this series. Let's do it. There we are, there's the first few terms. Does it surprise you that our f of t, which was originally consisting of a sine part and a constant part, seems to have a Fourier series that is mainly cosines? I wonder if we can justify that a little bit. Let's go back and look at the graph. Near the start of the recording, we commented that this graph demonstrated neither odd symmetry nor even symmetry. But actually, in a sense, it is almost even. It would be even if the vertical axis was shifted, say, pi by 2 to the right, like this. In other words, a horizontal shift on this function turns it into an even function. When a function is almost even in this sense, then we should not be surprised to find that its Fourier series consists mostly of even functions, namely cosine functions. The fact that our function that we started with was not quite even, but only after a horizontal shift, is reflected in the fact that we got that extra term, b1, the term that led to the half sine t. In discussing this feature, I hope I'm convincing you that it's sometimes worth thinking about the results you get and trying to make sense of them. Sometimes in the study of Fourier series, you can even use the notion of horizontal and vertical shifts to adjust a function to make it even or odd. That will save you some work calculating coefficients. I might discuss that somewhere else in another maths cast. I'm going to stop there.